to End Generation Project Rebroadcast of Daily Excellence, podcast number 36, where we join Mike from Council of Time on an insightful Friday night broadcast titled, Council of Time Podcast Transformative Power of Forgiveness. Before we get to our podcast episode 36, we want to shout out our listeners and show them gratitude for helping kick off this channel with overwhelming success. Hello to Teresa Chilton in Kentucky and Lorena Lancaster in Wichita, Kansas, and another listener in Southeast Kansas, Kansas Represent. We also like to thank a listener in Canton, Ohio. Also, folks way down in Sylacauga City located in Talladega County. Way, way down in the fine state of Alabama, and a listener on the West Coast in Gresham, Oregon. Hello and thank you, thank you. We have our listeners that have been dedicated since the beginning. Members like Miss Fifth Stone and Miss Bean Stalker. Let's say hello to Francis and to Chris Baker and Roxanne Miller. Thank you all for your prayers and spending time in the Word with us. You make what we set out to do already worth it. God bless all of you. Now, before we get to the rebroadcast of Council of Time podcast, Transformative Power of Forgiveness, remember for more Council of Time content, be sure to visit and show your support for Michael and the whole gang over at the Council of Time at their only official website, linked in the description below. Now, let's get into today's message. Council of Time podcast, Transformative Power of Forgiveness. Episode number 36, Blessings. Well, I am here. I made it. Good to see you guys this evening. Hope that everybody is not a popsicle. You know, what a day. What a day. Last night after I was uh, talking to Pastor Paul, I was doing a little bit of work. And so I kind of drifted off, you know, uh, about four hours later. And I woke up absolutely frozen. <laughs> the furnace motor froze up. It, it just stopped. It seized up. Can you guys believe that? Can you believe that? Just seized up. And uh, that was just not good. So, of course... But I had something on hand for that. I did. But it was cold. It was very cold. It wasn't too bad of a deal, though. Not too bad of a deal. But it was quite cold. Things like that happen when you have an ability to do something. You better believe something will always take place to bring you out of your complacency, whatever level that is. Expect it, right? That's normal. Hopefully you know that. That's normal. I'm, I'm also, I'm very thankful for things like that, right? I am. Do you guys know what happens when everything is okay in your life? Anybody? When everything is all right in your life and it's good to go, do you understand what really happens? You become blank. You do. You become very blank. And if you're not careful, you'll develop a lifestyle. Of celebration only. No sobriety, just celebration. When that takes place, that's when you start complaining. It will ease into you. So when things go wrong, they always seem to go wrong in an area you have to pour yourself into. And believe me, it requires all of you to get the job done, you know, 100% of you. But when that happens, when you're thrown out of your complacency, you are alert, you're awake, right? You are. You tend to look at things differently. You're thankful, right? You have your own little celebration at the end. It wakes you up to a degree, right? And if we're not, if we're not awakened from time to time by the issues and problems that we do have in life, we reach a dullness, a moment in life where everything is dull, lifeless, right? All of us have an experience with a time in our lives where everything seemed dead. And it was dead because we had everything under control. Dead, almost lifeless. When the challenges come, just in case you have not figured this out, when the challenges come, that's when you come alive. 
And do you not know that that keeps you going? It keeps you alive, right? If that weren't the case, many of us would be totally out of shape, done for, couch potatoes, for real, right? We would be. We would then turn bitter. We turn bitter, and it's just not good to be that way. And I've noticed that in life, that every single time in my life, when, when things are somewhat under control, something will always take place that will exercise skill sets that I may not have used for a long time, right? Never the stuff I'm working in. It's always the, the, the thing you almost forgot. And when that happens, right, and, and something gets repaired or you get through a process, you have a small celebration. You're very appreciative. Prior to that time, you reach a plateau. You reach an area where you start thinking about a lot, right, in your mind. Lord knows I don't need to do that. But you start thinking about a lot. You start uh, counting what you don't have or counting what's not meant or counting what's not been going right. That can turn you very bitter. So it seems like with all of us, indeed with humans in the first place, the Father has this process where we are tried from time to time in those things we have long forgotten about. It's kind of like dusting off the skill set that you have, that you haven't used in a while. I've also noticed something else. That sharpens you, the individual. It sharpens you. It broadens you. It awakens you. Now, this normally happens right before a time where you need to be awake. I've noticed that with me anyway. Anytime I have an issue like that, normally the time after, it's a time where I have to be very alert. From what's been happening lately, I would say that we're about to, you know, reach a time where we have to be very alert, very alert, very uh, diverse, flexible. And it's going to be very trying. But it's all part of the process. You guys belong to Christ. Never forget that. So you're not the average person, right? You are the beloved. Correct? And we have to remember what Jesus said. There's no more Jew, no more Greek, no more Gentile, no more this, no more that. When you're in Christ Jesus. Right? You're, when you're in Christ, your lineage, whatever that is, it no longer matters. Right? It doesn't matter. Your background doesn't matter. Once you're in Christ, you're all one all of the same group, believers, right? Remember that. Because as each and every one of you start going through these little trials to wake you up, and you will notice them. And in the process of, if, when you look at things by faith, you'll notice the, the teacher, the, whoever it is, whoever leads your group, they're going to go through things first. Right? Because they have to be qualified to talk to everybody else in truth. I can't talk to I can't tell you to maintain your patience when you're going through a problem and I have no patience. I can't do that. Right? I can't even I can't speak that. In fact I can't speak anything I've not gone through and I overcome. So what the Lord does is for you people out there who teach and preach and everything else, you'll go through something first. You will. You go through something first, and it can be quite uh, trying, right? When you go through it, make sure you're not whining, you're not crying, you're not throwing a pity party. Never throw a pity party. Pity parties, that's another excuse. That's how people try to adopt the sympathy of others. And if you're not careful, you get into usury. So don't throw a pity party. You'll go through something. And you have to go through it first. Now, in that process, you leaders and teachers and ministers and everybody else, once you go through something like that, the reason you go through it and overcome it is so that you can help those who are about to go through it. The same process that works on that teacher, that leader, that whoever it is, that same process that they have to go through is everybody else is going to have to go through too. Whether it be a sickness or whatever the case is, so that when everybody else starts to go through it, that teacher can encourage you, that minister can encourage you in truth.
And whenever we operate in the truth, that's when the outcome of Christ is seen. God doesn't want us operating in any falsehoods. And let's go ahead and face it. In, in various cultures of the world, including Western culture, right? Middle Eastern culture, it doesn't matter what your culture is. We have embraced a lifestyle that is incredibly haphazard. We talk about subjects and things we have no experience with, and there's no penalty. And we have to be careful not to do that, right? Now, why would anybody go through something like that in the first place? Because it awakens you prior to a time when everybody needs to be awake and sharp and mindful of the most time. That means he's about to bring everybody through a moment. That means you're about to go through a many walk in the desert. That means you're about to be elevated to the very next level of things. Every process you go through will elevate your life. It's a process of growth and deliverance always. And within that process is correction, right? Chastisement, you name it, it's in there. All of it's for your spiritual growth. So, again, whoever, the, the, you know, the, that teacher or leader or whoever it is, they're going to go through it first. So that they will be qualified to speak truth to you and encourage you when you go through it. Then when you guys go through it, those who already went through it can speak to you in truth that you have the breakthrough. The teacher does not get the breakthrough. It's designed they don't get the breakthrough, right? They endure the whole process so they understand the whole process. So they can talk to everybody at many different levels. Do you guys see that? You see that? I, I, I wouldn't want to be delivered from a process, right? And all of you begin to go through that same process in diverse levels. And yet, because if I've been delivered, I'm going to be pulled out of that process, not being able to fully engage you in your process. So what the Lord does, you notice this in the Word of God. Disciples, they go through the whole thing. Apostles, they went through the whole thing, Right? Uh, well, apostles were disciples, but they go through the whole thing. Prophets, they go through the whole thing. And in fact, prophets go through it big time. Then when they speak to the people, they speak qualified speech, right? Real speech. They operate in the truth. There's always a breakthrough in the truth. Always. It's important leaders also, when the people do have a breakthrough, when they you don't have that aspect of their process, and they are delivered from it. Whoever's in charge, they take no credit for it. None. Zip zero. And never allow themselves to be magnified, but to understand this is our Father's process. I think those processes are extremely important. Those are trials and tribulations, something none of us should be afraid of. Because for us, they grow us. They deliver us. Parents, you're going to go through things so that when your kids begin to go through things, you can speak to them in truth, not falsehoods. See, it is false. If, 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 if I'd never gone through, say, a, a divorce, right? Say I'd never gone through a divorce. And then i am talked to a bunch of people who have gone through a divorce. And we're talking about the Word of God. Now, in truth, I have no business talking to those people about rebounding from divorce because I have no truthful experience with it, right? And so whoever that person is, they just simply can't cover that area. Which means a leader's life is going to look like a wreck. I hope you know that. Right? It's going to look like an absolute disaster. The truth is, with many trials and tribulations... You have to go through a bunch of stuff. Many of you have, you have gone through horrific things. Some of you are ashamed of what you have gone through. And in truth, it's a shame that you're ashamed. Because what you have gone through is invaluable for the body of Christ. What you have endured is invaluable for the body of Christ. Hmm? Somebody needs to know that you came through it. That does, that does incredible things to a person. 
when they realize they're no longer alone in what they're going through, when somebody else has gone through it also. And there's nothing better than when you're in the middle of a crisis, somebody can come along beside you and really understand what you're going through and simply, simply abide with you as you go through that process. There is no other healing salve like that. And when that does happen, when you go through something and somebody else has experience with it, do you understand that there are no scars from what you went through? You do understand that. You can help people like that. So that means the more you rely upon the Lord when you're going through life, the more you're going to be a benefit to everybody else. God had you. So there, there are so many people who run from what they have gone through, right? They do. They've run. Right? Now, take me for example, right? I shouldn't be effective in anything I do. Do you know what the difference is? Do you guys know what the difference is? I'm passionate about those things I talk about. I don't back down from positions either. Have you noticed? Why? And it makes a difference. Because when you're passionate about something, you don't back down. Satan can never manipulate. He can never manipulate the help somebody else may receive. And it just so happens, every single time we talk, people write and say, you just talked about my situation. And I thought I was just totally alone in that. It is a, it, it's a blessing when you have things like that. But it's, it also kind of churns your heart a little bit. In my case, right? Because I do want to reach, I know people have gone through things. I know that a lot of people do not volunteer information like that because they've had traitors in their lives. They've been backstabbed a lot. And it's very difficult to find some earthbound confidant like that because people talk too much. They do. Or they'll judge you by what you've gone through. It's incredibly important to me. I'm not like that. I'm just me. I'm not like that because I've gone through quite a bit and I can see the value of it when I'm talking to other people, which is why I wouldn't change anything that ever happened in my life, good or bad, I wouldn't change it. Because it allows me to communicate on a very real level. Plus, when Satan comes in with his doubting tongue, right, you know those thoughts that come in and say, you're not going to get through this. Your life is going to be an absolute, you know, nightmare. You'll never succeed in doing this, and, and this won't work. See, a person like me who has gone through it, I will not allow him to speak in that situation. Or another person will contemplate these thoughts and sometimes fall prey to it. A person like me who has gone through things, just like you, won't give Satan an inch. He cannot tell me another person won't be delivered. So that's when people start giving up on themselves. Well, I tend to talk differently, do things differently. Right, I engage different. A lot of people have told me I won't let them give up. Somebody even told me one time, you you got to you got to give a person room to give up. No, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. They speak doubt. I see the truth. And when you can speak in truth, you better believe your father's connected. The the Lord is not connected to any lie. We would tell anything stretched, anything like that. He's not involved. And when he's not involved, there is no, there's no heavenly outcome, right? There's no faith outcome. When he is involved, you're like a bulldozer plowing down every single negative thing you could ever see. So that means everything in your life, when you go through things, prepares you to speak to those who will go through it. Not who might go through it, who will go through it. And again, we go through these things on a collective level. That's when the Father moves the entire body to a different level altogether. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that process is beginning. I believe that's beginning. You know, I was reviewing some of the video in Israel. Prior to Hamas invading Israel, well, I, I, I always hear it. I hear a lot of people saying nothing can touch Israel. That is God's people, this and the other. 
But then when you look at the videos, and, and, and listen to the whole thing, don't misunderstand me. When you listen to the videos, and you hear children crying out, help us. Right? They just, their parents were shot by police officers. They thought were police officers' parents were shot, people killed, doing this, that, and the other. They've gone through some things, right? Which means evil touched them, correct? Right? And when you talk to a Christian, it's hard to justify that. And it's a very difficult conversation to have with someone. If they say, well, I thought God's people would never be touched. So how did that happen? You know, how did that happen? Why is this evil coming upon God's people? Why would God allow and other people to be able to do that in the first place. So they can't see. They can't see. And if you're looking at that on the outside, all you can see are acts of terror. As soon as you step in that path of faith, you begin to see something very different. Very different. Did people go under duress? Yes, they did. As they have before in past times. As they've been going through the rest just about every single day of their lives. They've gone through duress. Was it massive? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. But I want you guys, since you believe in Christ, that you believe in prophecy. And you know what Israel is about to go through. Don't you? You also know that prior to this attack on Hamas, a lot of people were saying Israel can't be touched. See, there are a lot of Christians right now. They're nervous. They say, well, if that can happen to them, it can happen to us. If that evil can overcome them, can get to them, it can also get to us. But they're missing the entire point. See, the Lord knows exactly what he's doing. He does. God has this way of removing sufferings. That a person could remember to get the value out of whatever happened, but they are disconnected from the torment of that thing. And it causes them to step into the realm of truth, not fantasy, but truth. Right? We're not talking about stepping into the realm of what people think is reality. No, but truth, truth, truth. It is caused, for example, this one little girl, it has caused her to be extremely devout to the Father. That, in turn, has caused many of those, many people who don't accept Christ to take a second look. A second look at what happened when Christ was here in the first place. Do you know that? Because, see, they too thought God won't tolerate any of us to be touched. But they were touched. And because they were touched... They can no longer say, God won't tolerate them to be touched. And when you, say you have an honest rabbi who is doing everything he knows to do right, and he does so, and it still fails. Well, then something's not right there, is it? Something is missing. And it's causing many of those to go back to revisit Christ in the first place. I think it's amazing. I mean, they're going back to look at Christ and they're saying, wait a minute, did we make an arrogant mistake? And you know what? You can't get a rabbi to say that, to say, have we made an arrogant mistake? You're not going to get a rabbi to say that, right? But they're doing it. They're considering. Why? Because they were touched by evil. They were touched in one of the worst ways you can be touched. And the whole world was a witness to it. It wasn't two or three people. Nope, this was a whole lot of people. And in truth, if you believe that glass is bulletproof in front of you, and a bullet goes through that glass and strikes your shoulder, okay, you no longer believe that glass is bulletproof. So you're going to go back and you're going to say, wait a minute. Uh, how did I believe this was bulletproof in the first place? You're going to start your little investigation and correction. That's what's happening. It's also not, not only them, but it's preparing a lot of other people to take a second look at their life of faith and their belief. One guy said, 
One gentleman said, we've made it so routine that it has become a lifestyle like going to work and coming back home. Another one said they fell in love with the idea of faith, yet they never walked in it. They kept the ways and everything else, but they f didn't fully consider all things. They were closed off to a lot, right? A few admitted that there's bitterness still in the divide of the Torah and other things. And it, so, so God's doing a work. Oh, he's doing a work. See, because greater things will come. We know the purging is coming. We know this. We do. We know it. And it always happens when God's people stand against one another. That's how you know what's coming. Right now in the USA, there are many of God's people who stand against one another. They love Christ, yes, but they don't like each other, and that's a problem. How can two people love the Lord genuinely but not like each other? I'll tell you why. Whispers and ideologies are in between them. They're believing something that would divide them. And the Lord's going to have that removed. Because he's preparing you for his arrival. You have to be prepared for that. You're not going to show up to the greatest event in existence and not have the right clothing on. He's preparing you. Expect the Lord to disprove every falsehood we hold close. Expect every falsehood to fail us. Expect it. Expect it. That's why even, have you guys noticed I hold back on boasting on anything that I truly do think versus what's written in the Word of God? Have you noticed, right, that I, I leave certain things alone? I can have an idea, but I'm not sticking to it. I'm not going to stick to an idea. That's God's Word. That's a holy word. I'm not doing it. When you observe everything, you can see what the Lord is doing. The alarm clock is about to go off. Because if it doesn't go off, God's people will further degrade. You see, God is love, correct? God is love. Why would hatred be in us and we belong to him? This bitterness we have within us and against each other which spawns secret conversations, secret ideologies, points of view that stab others who also love the Lord. All these are abominations in the eyes of the Most High, and he must remove them prior to his arrival. And he will remove them. God is love, and he operates in love. He does not operate in hatred. In fact, in the Bible, it says that when a person is in that hatred type thing, God has lifted from them. His grace is lifted from them. So that means when you're, when you're operating in anger and hatred, you're in grave danger. You don't have grace in those moments. And bad things happen with hatred. Maybe a loss has come by hatred. If you look carefully at your own life, you'll see it. It's almost like hatred is never excused. It's going to cost us something every single time. But why do we use that so freely? We're stubborn species, yes. But the Lord knows how to correct his children. And he's bringing all of us to a brand new level. Not the level we've been operating in, where we have these petty fights, no but a level of actually walking in faith and doing the work in the earth. Not just bragging and sitting at the same time, but not saying a word and actually doing. Being effective. Because times are changing quickly. And how can any of us actually say, oh, well, I'm not taking the mark of the beast? We know what Thessalonians says about that day everybody is looking for, 
when everybody is changed in a twinkling of an eye, when the dead rise first. We know that day people are looking for. The apostle expressly said that day shall not come, lest there come a falling away first and that man of perdition be revealed. That day will not come, lest there come a falling away first and that man of perdition be revealed. Well, if that man of perdition is revealed, the Bible tells us how he reveals himself, how he is revealed. We're going to have to deal with parts of the mark. And all those who are written in the book of life, they overcome the beast, the mark, the number of his name. They overcome it. They overcome the dragon by the blood of the lamb. They overcome the beast by the blood of the lamb. They overcome the antichrist by the blood of the lamb. That means we'll have no weak spots. And if we're not going to give in to that, that means we can't be fooled anymore. It also means our loyalty no longer lies with these kingdoms in the earth, but solely with our Father in heaven and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's a transition of great transitions. In order for us to get to that place, everything must be uncovered now. In order for us to survive what's going to be uncovered, we're going to have to get a little workout in truth, in our faith resolve, in many areas. So expect a process that will strengthen you. Expect a process to uncover things in your life so you can pluck them out. Expect a process that's going to try everything about you. Expect it. Because you're put here on this earth to make it. Not to fall prey to it. But to make it. Hmm? You're on this earth to make a difference. Most importantly, you're on this earth to fully be delivered. To be fully transformed. To become what you truly are to become. And this world is not your paradise. This life you're living right now, this is not your paradise. This life is only but a moment of time and it's over. Never listen to thoughts that will tell you that this life is somehow eternal. It is not. You are passers-by in this life. You guys remember that story about the passers-by, right? We have an audio of that. A passers-by can help with everything. But the people who live in a town whose store just got robbed and burned up, they're going to be, they're going to be crying, they're going to be hurt because it's their community. They're going to be emotional about what happens in their community. Now that passers-by can be sober. He sees the people crying, he can mourn with him, but he's a passers-by. He can assist, he can give them all help, but that's not his home. He's a passers-by. His heart, his heart is seated in a whole different place. He can do a lot of work there, but the people who live in that town, they self-destruct, don't they? When you live in a community, you take many different positions. You almost become like a mob. A passers-by can freely say, hey, you guys need help. A passers-by can do what nobody else can do. He can take risks. He or she can take risks. Risks of love. They can make a big difference. That's what you are. You're a passers-by. This is not your home. Not your paradise. You're a passers-by. You're here today. You're going to be gone tomorrow. You're a passers-by. You're here to assist people. You're passers-by. You're constantly growing, right? But the world can never put its claws in you to keep you. No, because you're a passers-by. You're on your way to another destination. And when that happens, right, you can also see the beauty of every place you pass, no matter how raggedy it looks. A person who has to live in raggedy conditions will fall prey to it. They'll look around and say, this is all we have. But a passers-by can see the beauty and the history of it. They will notice the land around it and everything else. 
When you feel like you're stuck in the world, you got to check your faith. There's no way you should ever feel that way because it's not real. It's not true. It isn't. Why would we believe and act on and live by something not true? Why would we ever be upset by something that's not true? See, we have to check ourselves. Because that's not operating in truth, is it? You have another destination. The Lord is preparing all of us to end up at that destination. To come through everything he said we would come through. That's why you should never degrade yourselves. Your father does not degrade you. Hmm? Somebody said, Mike said rapture was tomorrow. No. You are here today, gone tomorrow. You really are. The Lord said, tomorrow's promise to no man. That's what he said. The Lord said, take no thought of tomorrow, for today holds enough trouble for itself. The Lord reinforced that, saying, does God not take care of the birds and the beasts of the field? Right? He does. They don't worry about what they're going to eat or drink or anything else. Everything is provided. There's a way of life provided. But you are here today and gone tomorrow. You don't have tomorrow. I don't have tomorrow. The world, they live in tomorrow. You know what happens when you live in tomorrow? You've died today. You're dead today. Which brings up something else. So many Christians for so long have desired such absolute control over their lives. They live in tomorrow. They know everything about tomorrow. They know nothing about today. They're making such plans for tomorrow they can't help or assist anybody today. Somebody know what I'm talking about there? You know how when we have all these plans for the future, this, that, and the other, and but everybody who, who approaches us today simply gets in the way of our planning for tomorrow. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. We often neglect the beauty of this day for our thoughts of tomorrow. God did not give us tomorrow, nor did he promise us tomorrow. It's okay to have a plan, but you better believe this is the day God gave you. This is the day we should not neglect. Right? If you want super growth, I mean like miracle growth, right? Every day you wake up, there's some things a person should change. A lot of people used to say, well, you know what? Every day I wake up, I say, Lord, thank you. I'm alive today. Uh, that's no good. That's no good. That's vain. Why would a person wake up and thank the Lord that they're alive? For what? So they can corrupt this day like they did the day prior? No. I have a different phrase. Some of you old people in COT know that. It's something I do every day. It's a thought I truly have every day. Every day that I wake up, I'm thankful for another opportunity. To get right what I got wrong yesterday. To help someone that I didn't help the day prior. Right? And it becomes truly beautiful when you start thinking of it that way. Did you know I wake up smiling every single day? I do. Every day I wake up smiling. Never grumpy. Also wake up laughing sometimes. I do. Things are very, they, I guess you could say, they make me laugh sometimes a lot. But in a joy type way. I never wake up grumpy. Never. Despite everything I've gone through. And the reason why. Is because every time you wake up, you're not doing so by your own power. Science would have you believe. That's just the way things are. I've been through too many things to believe that. When you wake up, who allows you? Who allows you that life to wake up in the first place? Your father. When you wake up, who designed the day you're waking up in? Your father. Who gave you another chance? Your father. Another chance to do what? 
See, you have a heart's desire. All of you do. That people normally don't visit. You want to know something. Out of all you desire, you desire peace. Number one, not revenge and all that other stuff. You desire peace. You also desire to be the one who helped save somebody else. All of you have that in you. Every single last one of you, everybody who can hear me, you have that in you. You want desperately to have been a vessel that was used to help save somebody else. You want to do something good for somebody else. You do at the core of you. You want to do something good for somebody else. Your father in heaven knows that because he put that in you. That's part of him in you. Now, with those two goals in mind, normally a person will wake up not thinking of those things. They'll just wake up thinking of what they have to face. It becomes all about them, how bad they feel, the limitations they have, the troubles they have to handle, right? And it can consume you, young people. There are points you're going to be consumed with what you have no ability to do. Sometimes you're going to be consumed with problems. But I'm trying to tell you that's a mindset. It has nothing to do with reality. Of all of what people worried about, why are you still here? When you were worried about those problems that you had, something spoke such falsehoods in your mind that you no longer had a good thing in your mind, but you were overwhelmed by bad whispers that your stomach turned upside down inside out and you became sick and you know what's funny those whispers don't really speak anything did you notice they don't because you can try and look back to hear the thoughts that came into your head they said absolutely nothing but they whispered things they gave you the idea that the worst of the worst was going to be upon you they gave you the idea that you were an absolute 100% failure. You thought you were going to be embarrassed in front of everybody else. You thought you let everybody down. All these things, though those whispers, they don't say anything. What they cause us to do is entertain all of our fears. Yes, those things you don't want to become, they suggest it. Whatever you don't want to become, they suggest it. And they have you say it. They have you afraid of it, and you think that thing will come. But listen, it didn't come, did it? It did not come. That heavy, heavy, heavy crushing thing, it didn't take you out, did it? You're right here, right now. Isn't that something? So guess what? It lied to you. It lied. It flat out lied. You're right here. You're right here. In your life, when you let somebody else down, you thought that, you know, something came against you. That was conspired against you. And it lied to you. It tried to make you feel like you were a failure. It lied to you. Because you're right here right now. You're not only right here right now. But you're still going forward. Even when you said, I can't do this anymore, you're, you're right here today. Some of you said that last week. I don't think I can do this anymore. Well, here you are. So something has been lying to you. And here you are. Here you are. I mean, you have another day, then guess what? You have another opportunity. Another God doesn't give an opportunity out of hatred. God doesn't give an opportunity out of any negative quality. He gives you another opportunity out of love. Do you know why? Here it is. Because God can do nothing but love you. If God is love, and some of you haven't gotten this yet, if God is love, and the Bible says God is love, and people degrade that passage, that's one of the most powerful passages you could ever read. So let me put it together. If God is love, 
And he's constantly saying, he's your father. And Jesus is constantly saying, he's your father. Right? Then your God will do nothing less than love you all the way. Because he's your God. He's your father. And in the Bible it says, he is love. And Jesus drove it home and said, he is your father. Jesus came here to this earth to let you know he is your father. That he sent the son to forgive all of what you would do. What is that telling you? He has, he has no ability to do anything other than love you. And he made it to be so. That's why that word, that phrase is driven home that he's your father. I mean, it's driven into the everywhere. When you read the Bible, the Bible is telling you that God is your father. The Bible is telling you that God is love, which means love is your father. Nothing but love. Hatred is not your father. Punishment is not your father. Revenge is not your father. No. Love is your father. And if love is your father, then love is not concerned about what you fail to do. Love is concerned about fulfilling a heart's desire to do good. My goodness, that's who your father is to you. That's why he's your father. Is he the father of those in the world? No, he is not. He's your father. Jesus made that clear. Those of the world, he said, your father is the devil. And the deeds of your father you will do. Your father, however, is love. Do you all see that? So when you're moping around thinking that you've gone through something bad, out of punishment, your father is not punishment. Your father is love. When you have a hard day, you're in a crisis moment, you might want to remember that your father is love. Look into that situation, that hardship, whatever you're going through. And I'm telling you something, your father is still love. And if your your father dictates things in your life, what you know, what can touch you and what can't, then you better believe that everything you go through is out of his love for you. He's bringing, because you have a root desire within yourself to do what? To truly, to truly help save somebody else. To truly do something good for somebody else. I mean, you want to do something good for somebody else. You get irritated, aggravated, mad, sad, and everything else when you can't do something good for somebody else. In your days of sin, what did you think about? Not only the sin, but that you did not do something good for somebody else. You have that root within you, and you want to do good for somebody else so that you know everything that you go through. Your father who is love is raising you up that you may do that thing. That you may finally be fulfilled. You will be fulfilled. He is going to bring all of us to that point of fulfillment. Not one of us is going to be lacking. Everything in your life is leading up to this. And every day that God gives you, you better believe, is that you, that you may grow, that you may be victorious, that you may do that thing that you've never been able to do. Because when you do it, some people know something you may not. When you accomplish that in your father, and you do so out of love, you'll never part ways from the path of love again. You'll say to yourselves, now I've found home. It's not some place, house you go to or something like that. No. You remember when Jesus said the kingdom of God does not come with observation. No one's going to say, here it is, lo, there it is. The kingdom of God within you. Remember he said that? Remember that was written in the Bible? Hmm? The kingdom of God is born within you. 
comes from within you, right? This is a growing thing that has already started within you. It has not come to fulfillment, but it begins within you, not outside of you, inside of you. God knows that root desire because that root desire is from him. You're partakers of his spirit. You come from his spirit, not anybody else's. And he knows exactly how to raise you. All this stuff you see in Revelation, all this stuff you see in the world, it's raising people up. And they will accomplish what the Lord has, has them to accomplish. He's not going to turn and hate them because he's your father and he is love. And all processes in your life will take root, will take effect, and you will be victorious in Christ. You will not fail, especially those of you who truly do love Christ. You're not going to fail. It's impossible. So with every single day, when you know your father is loved, then you know that the point of that day is based in love. Then you can smile. No matter what you're going through, you should have, you should know by now that somehow, some way, possibly outside of your thinking, that the Lord, that the Father, they have a promise upon you. God's not like us. He's not like me. He doesn't break promises. He promised you a victory. He promised that you would be victorious. Every day of your life, you better believe your day is designed to lead you to that path, that line of the victory. And once you have that victory, that's only the beginning of something no one can explain, no one can describe. That's why each day is an opportunity and a blessing. That's why sobriety is something we should choose rather than be forced to go into, right? The Lord's doing it. He's been doing it. All this time, he's been doing it. And every situation in your life has lied to you. Isn't that something? Every issue lied to you. All those whispers lied to you. But your father has consistently communicated to you a truth. That's why we have to be careful to keep it about the Lord's word, right? Not go off the deep end, creating things and promises and all this other stuff, no. But it's important that people know exactly what Jesus said, what the Lord has given through the apostles and prophets. Those things are important. There is a massive, consistent event from start to finish in that right? the more we can the more we can embrace and get that word out my goodness because all of us are being brought to that place where we will overcome the dragon we will overcome the beast we will not take the mark of the beast we will have the victory over every evil thing in the earth and that's you right now that's you you know that little passage that says they love not their lives unto death? All right? Some of us right now, we'd run away if something like uh, some Hamas ran into the USA and did what they did in the USA. And now before you say that can't happen, don't say that. Never say what cannot happen. There's no need to ever say that. The Lord is showing us something. And I'm telling you right now, Anything that happens in Israel, we will eventually endure. But isn't it awesome what the Lord is truly doing? Hmm? He said they loved their lives not unto death, which means the idea of death or fear itself was not enough to cause them to part ways with the righteousness of the Most High. That is incredible. 
That's incredible. They overcame all this evil by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. You know who he was talking about? You. He was talking about you. You. He was talking about you. You will overcome by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of his testimony. And you will love not your lives unto death. You'll overcome by Christ, by what he's doing in your life. Not by what we're doing, good or bad. No, if you love Christ, there is the seal. Let me ask you, all of you something before I take a break. In this day that you're in right now, in truth, do you really accept the sacrifice of the Lord on the cross that he died for you, yes or no? Can anybody in this place say, I, I can't accept it or I don't accept it? Anybody? Is there anybody who does not believe Jesus died on the cross. You know what the truth is? We have a knowing. We can cry. We can whine. We can scratch, tear, do all sorts of things all day. But we know Jesus was on that cross. We may not know the details in truth, but we know that through Jesus, we are. That by Christ, we have an opportunity. There's something in us that won't allow us to say it never happened. There's something very authentic within us that reaffirms the sacrifice of Christ. Something very deep. All of you who believe that, you did not put that belief in yourselves, but your Father put that belief in you. You did not choose him first. He chose you first. We're the ones running around with amnesia, not knowing all the details of what we have come from. But God put things in you, not so that you would be lost, but so that you would be kept until the very end. And Jesus told us what God's will was, what his ultimate will was. You know what he told us the ultimate will of God is? Do you guys know what the will of God is? What the absolute will of God is? Anybody? Jesus told us. It is incredibly powerful. Not a lot of people talk about it. They don't. Jesus said that it is the will of God that Jesus Christ not lose any of us. Did you hear that? It is the will of God that Christ not lose any of us. Did you hear that? That's God's will. That Christ not lose any of us. So that tells you something. It tells you who's been directly involved in your life. Christ. All this stuff that we're going through, all these levels where we believe and drift and, and, and we act like we don't believe, but we go right back home. See, when you go back home to Christ, right? Listen to me. When you go back home to Christ, how many have gone, first of all, how many have gone back home to Christ after drifting from time to time? How many have gone back home to Christ? How many? 
type of wonder if you've gone back home to Christ after you drifted. I'll type a one. Put my one in there. If you've gone back home to Christ after you drifted, type a one. Be on. You can be honest. Just if you, if you've gone back home to Christ, type a one. See, you guys just confirmed it. <laughs> you just confirmed. No matter what your differences are. No matter what what how different your belief is from somebody else's in these nuances in faith. You just you just confirmed it. You just confessed something. You did. See if I would have said this, how many of you honestly and truthfully believe that Christ is not gonna lose you? See, that's when you start scratching your head. See, all of you would say, hmm, I don't know, I don't know about that. But see, I didn't do that. I set you up for failure. I wanted to know what you would call home, and you called Christ home. You identified with Christ as being home. So because you did that, guess what? You're one of those that Christ keeps. Because you're the one that called him home. You're the one that agreed that you went home to Christ. You did that. You identified with that. You did that. And you know what that means? Huh? You know what that means, don't you? You're one of those. Christ said he will not lose. He will not lose. Jesus said. Jesus said. All who come to me, the Father hath given me. And I will in no wise lose. I'm not going to cast him out. I will raise him up the last day. You're one of those. That's who you are. See, you won't admit that any other way. You'll come up with too many excuses. Well, you know, I don't think so. You know, the, the stuff starts. The stuff starts. You know, the stuff we have in us. It starts. The negative thoughts we have in us. The, 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 the things we say. I didn't ask you that. I wanted to know what you identified with this home. And all of you volunteered that Jesus was home. Medi called you right back home again. So if you can identify that with home, you did that from the heart. Because you know what it is to drift. And you know that Christ was home. He called you back home. And when you were back with Christ, you were back home. You may have fallen a billion times after that. But you keep going back home. And that means everything. See, it doesn't matter how many times you fall. It matters where you go after you fall. Doesn't matter how many times you fall down, it matters how you get up and where you go after you get up. Stop counting losses and mistakes and shortcomings and all those different things. Even your Father in Heaven does not want to remember them. He's the one that said he's going to throw your sins into the sea of forgetfulness and remember them no more. He's the one that said that. And why? Because he knows what's in you and you don't. You don't know what's in you. It's not revealed to any of us yet, the fullness of what's in us. We read certain things, but God says you don't know. You do not know. Right now you're operating at limited capacity for the purpose of this process. You're purposely not at full strength. Isn't that something? That's purpose. But it means your father's never going to give up. And he will accomplish what he set out to do. Which is what? To have you in a position... To be victorious in the end. Not by your power. In the Bible it says he will finish the work he began in us. In all cases, our Father will complete this in us. So get ready for his truth. Not your own. My truth is not truth. My truth is a perspective. Or gibberish. But it's not truth. God's truth is the truth. And get ready for your Father's truth. Not our garbage truth. We just have nothing but garbage truth. The Lord has the truth. 
get ready for his truth. Not ours. Get ready for his truth. It is surely on its way. And you are those who are supposed to be right here in this time where you are. If you're 192 years old, you're supposed to be right here in this time. Lord knows. I'll be right back in a few minutes right here at COT. Jesus said, all who come to me, the Father hath given me. Right? All who come to me. How does one go to Christ? What does that mean? What does that mean, guys? going to Christ. Here's what it means. You ever reach that point when you're sick of your own life? Anybody? When you're tired of your own life? Hmm? When you don't want your life anymore. When you realize what your life is. You guys ever reach that point? When you look at your life and you honestly say, what a mess. What a mess, and you're just done with it. Hmm. That's the beginning of going to Christ. Do you know that? Peter, the apostles, before they were apostles, they were disciples. They were at a dead end. Some doing horrible things. Do you know that? Some doing horrible things. Absolutely horrible things. Even unto their own people doing horrible things. And they saw Christ. They heard him. They heard him teach something different than they were living. They were so sick of their own lives. They heard Christ teaching about a kingdom, about ways and standards and all different things. And you know what they said to themselves? Same thing we do. They looked at their life and they said, I don't even identify with that anymore. I'm sinking where I'm at. They desired, they really connected with Christ. Because they said, I don't want to be here. I want to be, be around and be with. I agree with what he's teaching. Most people look at Christ and they start looking at the religious things and that's what they want. And that's not what I saw. You know what I saw? I can't talk about you guys. I can only talk about me. I can talk about some of the disciples as to what they wrote. They hit a dead end. A dead end. Mary says, Michael, we have on right now concerning suicide more than that. There are 12 in Europe right now doing the same exact thing. I see five chat rooms, and that happened.